conversation is an intimate fireside discussion uh, with Mills Mills from uh, Bitpub, <laughs> Bitpub Key in New York, and Mike Brock, who is the CEO of TBD. Just to clarify, I'm not the head of PubKey in New York. Um, I'm the head of content and partnerships for PubKey, which is a Bitcoin bar in the West Village. And they just celebrated their one year anniversary this October. And if you haven't been, if you're in New York, you can pay for a very good hot dog or smash burger or beer in Bitcoin. And it's a pretty fun experience. Um, this was going to be a panel that is now a fireside. So, I will still have my guest, Mike, introduce himself, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Mike Brock, as you heard, the CEO of TBD. We are one of four business units at Block. Super happy to, to be here. Um, I was here last year um, talking about our mission. We're back here again. As some of you may have seen, we, we got to announce our partnership with Yellow Card here, on, on, uh, here at the conference yesterday. So, you know, just to kind of recap for those of you uh, who need one, we are an open source uh, financial tech, decentralized financial tech company inside the block umbrella, working on open source protocols, uh, open standards for a more inclusive global financial system. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin plays a really big part of that in our strategy, so that's why we're here. I've been working on Bitcoin in one way or another at Block since 2017 when I led our Bitcoin initiative inside Cash App, which is now you know a very successful product in and of itself within our Cash App umbrella, super proud of that, um, and been working in and around the fringes of, of Bitcoin, like I said, one way or the other, including um, really with, with a real personal passion on how Bitcoin can advance human rights, um, particularly in, in parts of the world where um, people are excluded from the financial system due to uh, either political, the political situation or um, for, other, for other reasons. So um, I'm, I'm really passionate about the, the potential of these, these types of technologies, Bitcoin in particular, to really emancipate people from, uh, in many cases, um, outright oppression. Um, and, and obviously, I think that there's a place here for uh, mainstream usage of, of Bitcoin um, long term and, and stable coins. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really just uh, passionate and, 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 and super excited to be here in Africa again, seeing the energy and, and the potential for this technology to be really transformative. Maybe starting there, and then we can kind of talk more about traditional product market fit. Um, I think we share in common. I think the Human Rights Foundation and the work they do is has been some of the most inspirational and uh, a different angle and vantage point on why Bitcoin is great and what Bitcoin can do. And that's uh, a diff finding very different markets and use cases for Bitcoin. But I often comment like, yeah, it's cool to have Bitcoin in America and it does make some things easier. But when you look at the global south, when you look at Latin America, there's just so many use cases that are life changing and not just convenient maybe or cool. As far as you know, what you've been able to build, how do you see the, the product market fit of even the new things? I mean, I know the, the partnership with TBD and Yellow Card, but do you see anything else kind of coming up? Yeah, um, well, to, to, to at least to double click on that for a second uh, before I get into the, the future, I, I do think that remittances are a really exciting use case for Bitcoin, I know that there's a lot of people in the space that will roll their eyes at that. They see that as like a very sort of small thinking way of thinking about the potential of Bitcoin, because it seems like, you know, you know, I, I you know, I even heard some of those opinions here that it that it's not thinking big enough. It's not, it's not taking into account the realities of lack of access to financial services um, in 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 countries that that don't have a functional 
uh, financial system. My good friend Alex Gladstein from the Human Rights Foundation, which you just mentioned, wrote a book on this called Check Your Financial Privilege that really kind of talks about that, that very dynamic. Um, what, what I would say as well, though, is that if you're thinking about how to, how to build something that is going to endure, that's going to have momentum, that's going to have an ecosystem that, that self-perpetuates, I think it is really important to have real, a really strong foundation of like core use cases that serve the greatest number of people um, that's possible. And I don't think remittances is really a boring use case. I mean, like, how amazing is it that we can connect the world together using an internet like an internet native neutral freedom money that I can like I can get a Bitcoin address from any of you in this world and I can go back to Los Angeles and then I can instantaneously send you value from across the world without going through any intermediaries without going through you know the the correspondent banking system I mean that's that's kind of just like just think about that that's like incredible and and obviously that's like not enough like we need to have infrastructure around Bitcoin that, what's that? I said off-ramps, you know, it's nice to off-ramp to LA, but that, it, that's the big thing, right? It, it's not even just about on-ramps and off-ramps, right? It's about how do, you, how do you mediate trust in the digital realm? People don't think about this, right? They think, well, I have a public, I have a wallet, you, ha you can give me a QR code, I can pay you. That's that's fine. Like that, like, like and 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 I use it for that. Like I, I, you know, I I I make donations to human rights causes through Bitcoin all the time. But and and that and that feels really amazing and super powerful. The the thing that I the, the thing that I would tell people is is like in the real world, reputation matters. The ability to have recourse if if people don't provide you with the product that they promise to sell you or they don't render the service that they promise to provide, I mean these are things in the real world that people expect to be able to have some some way of of achieving like recourse, and some of like the cypherpunks get mad at me when I bring up this point, but I don't think we're moving into a future where everyone is essentially gonna be operating on a Silk Road type online marketplace where the sellers don't know who the buyers are and the buyers don't know who the sellers are. Like, that just is not a scalable way to do business. I mean, the real world, like, I wanna have honest business with people I know and trust and I can build reputation over time um, that, that they're, they're like, uh, Loyalty can be rewarded. Like if you're a regular customer at a business, they might want to do you a favor if they know who you are. So like, like there's there's real downsides to just assuming that in the future all of our bit transactions are going to be anonymous and that we're going to hide our identities from each other. I mean, it turns out to have really scalable, workable business for the average Joe on the street. You you probably want to know who your counterparty is, and people get scared of that, and they say, well, that sounds like KYC, and that's like government surveillance and stuff. And, and what I tell people is, it's like, you really have to ask yourself, like, what's at stake? Now, there's, there's, there's human rights activists here um, that I know personally and um, have worked with and supported that are literally on the runs from their government, literally on the run from their government. And I understand they need that privacy. They need that ability to send value and funds to to folks in in these in these places to, to support activists and support family members um, and they definitely don't want to be subject to KYC in, in those in those regimes where that could be mean life or death so I don't want to like preclude that but if you're talking about building product market fit for somebody who is not in that adversarial environment I don't think they're doing evil by wanting to not be anonymous so you can get the benefits of trust and you can get the benefits of, of, of loyalty, you can get the benefits of recourse if someone screws you over and you can actually, maybe you can call the police and say they stole from me because I, I know who they are. Um, like that is pretty, like that, that's, those things are needed and so we're working on those sorts of things to make payments in Bitcoin something that's actually scalable in the real world. Yeah, I mean, exactly that, it's the scalability because with this anonymous, I mean, it, it's maybe funny to say, but there is no, you know, customer service with Bitcoin. You are your own bank, and there's a lot of responsibility that an individual needs to assume. And that's amazing that you can do that, 
but there isn't always, like you're saying, a use case or a need case yes. for, for doing that. And frankly, a lot of people would probably prefer to not have to have that burden of responsibility on their shoulders, you know? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's a good way of framing it. Like, I think you, sh you, sh you, it's important that you can engage in anonymous transactions if you need to. Yes. And you always have that recourse to go back to layer one or to go down to like raw lightning. But you might, you might prefer to use a marketplace protocol like TBDEX because maybe you're sending like money to your family and on the other side of the world and you really want to know it's your family, that it's not some scammer, that it's not some deep fake that was generated by like generative AI that's pretending to be your family, that you might want some cryptographic credential, right? Like it did, like a verifiable credential that proves with certainty that you're sending you know, your hard-earned money to, to, to your family on the other side of the world and you actually want them to be the ones who receive it. I mean, it's an important use case. Yeah, and it, it, it's almost like identity theft, right? Identity theft has looked a certain way in, in up to now maybe, but in the future, especially, you know, with all this new technology, with everything that ChatGPT, with MidJourney, with OpenAI, like there's just so many advances that can make a video with a deep fake, that can make photos so convincing, and that can really open up a very new world of identity theft that yes. can play in. And so it's not necessarily that we shouldn't be able to be private. It should always be an option. And it's, it's as much as, I love that you can read the code if you wanted to, the open source nature of Bitcoin that if you are interested, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 I think that um, there's a, a law, and I think it deserves a name, um, that I think is true, that Anonym anonymity is expensive. Like, it's socially expensive. Like, if I don't want you to know who I am in the real world, think of, like, like how much work I have to put into it. How do I get you things physically in the real world without you being able to trace it back to me? And I know people who live like this. I know cypherpunks. They, like, they walk around with three phones and MiFi's and, and like they go out of their way to not be known in the real world. A lot of them work in Bitcoin. We know some of them. Um, some of them are here. Um, and, um, and, and, and it's not, I, I'm sorry, but it's not practical for everyone. Everyone isn't going to wake up one day and be like, yeah, that's how I should live my life. Yeah. Um, and, and, I don't, and I think most, we're really social creatures, actually. We want people to know us. We want people to know our story. We want to be connected to people. And I think you, you know, it's, it's a tired phrase when you talk about product market fit and stuff and like meeting people where they are, but it's like true. And so I think Bitcoiners need to be building towards that reality if they want to have product market fit. And that's something we're doing at TBD. We get sometimes get criticized because we have this focus on identity and people think, oh my God, scary, KYC, government surveillance. I mean, it's not, if you actually look under the covers, I think we're actually building powerful privacy preserving infrastructure that allows people to know who their person is without necessarily a third party monitoring it, um, which is the great thing about DIDs and verifiable credentials. But, but yeah, there's this sometimes this irrational fear that the way that we build a free society in the future is by assuming that we're building towards an anonymous financial infrastructure. That's, nobody, like, you don't, if you think about the consequences of that, I don't think many people really want that. You may need it, like we just said, but that's not the world you want to live in. Yeah, it's not preferred. It's a high friction, and as with any privacy, there's trade-offs. And so it's convenience, it's cost, and there are very real use cases for ultimate extreme privacy, but there also is the social nature, as you mentioned, of humans. We, we want to be in community, we want to work together, we want to see our friends and hang out with our friends. All of the you know, social media this, this past, you know, almost 20 years has proven the, the desire for, maybe it's nosy, I mean, I think there, there have been nefarious uses by governments and companies to harvest the, the data to market better or sell, you know, things to the individuals, but it's because people want to talk and they want to hang out. And I have been talking a lot, my, my brother is building a, a lightning wallet, and I, I always talk to him about Venmo, and it kind of blows my mind 
that Venmo, you can like have it be public. And, your, and, and most people do. And it's most crazy. people do. And they, they put, you know, maybe it's a funny, cheeky message, or maybe it's an emoji, or maybe it's really what it was for. But there is that nature of you're communicating, and I think the more Bitcoin can mimic what's already working, talking about a market, right? There's already, Venmo has a market, it's doing very great work, but what you're doing with Venmo is you're turning your dollars into Venmo dollars, and then sending Venmo dollars to your friend, and then they're turning Venmo dollars back into whatever their currency is. And Bitcoin has the opportunity to be that. Yes. And as long as we, I mean, I think we should always acknowledge the cypherpunk legacy and history with which Bitcoin emerged and is built on the shoulders of a lot of that protocol and intentionality. I think that's, it was built on that foundation, therefore able to be hyper-private. Yeah. But then we can build beyond that. Yeah, I, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing cypherpunks. Like, I, like I, as I mentioned earlier, there are some really close friends to me who governments literally want them dead. And so to the extent that cypherpunks are, are building the technology that keeps them safe, like I want that space to exist. I want cypherpunks thinking about privacy tech and thinking about how do you keep people protected in the digital realm. I just think we have to be honest that um, that is based on a need. Some people need that. Other people do not. Other people are in circumstances where that's not their top concern. And we want to build technology that can protect people when they need protection, but we also have to understand that there's people trying to put food on their table for their kids, and they're taking their kids to, you know, to soccer practice or, 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 or what have you, and they have other things on their mind, and, and, what, and it's, what's important for them is that like, they don't have to worry about misdirecting a payment and sending it to the wrong place and then figuring out, oh my God, how am I gonna get this back? You know, like, like that, that's, that's, those are the concerns that are gonna stop people from adopting this technology there because they're not, their number one concern isn't how do I stop the government from knowing that I sent my friend Bitcoin? That's, that they're, that they're not thinking about that. No, completely. So I guess to, to switch to a more, you know, product market, traditional, as, as you're assessing, you, you've built a few different products overall, and, and within those products, I'm sure micro products as well, but I, I think there's this almost chicken and egg scenario where maybe, you know, there's an idea and it is a, it's a solution to something, and then you almost, you have to compare it to the market and be like, well, does anyone want this, or does anyone need this, or will they pay for this, right? Can you give us, as we are wrapping up, can you give us kind of your, what you've learned, what, what mis valuable mistakes maybe you've made, or um, what you would say to anyone that's kind of looking to build a product? Um, experiment a lot and be prepared to change your mind when the evidence goes against you. The thing that, I, I think the thing that has served me well um, it's like what I realized when I really think back and look at it, I went down a lot of holes that, that had no exit. And I think maybe what I did well, what I did right, and what I think other, other people didn't do so well that I saw like kind of like failed, it was when people really s fall victim to the sunk cost fallacy. I spent six months on this product idea and then just simply not realizing that it's not going anywhere and realizing that it's time to pull the ripcord and to pivot in a different direction or to modify your product strategy. And we did that a lot. We did that with the Bitcoin product. We did, I did that you know, with, with, with a lot of the work that I did on Cash App over, over seven years was realizing when it's time to basically swallow your pride and say, this was the wrong idea. We have to go in a different direction. I don't think it's as simple as saying that there's this like checklist that you go through to verify to yourself that something has product market fit because ultimately sometimes something seems really good on paper and it just doesn't resonate with people or it, it has uh, side effects to how it works or the incentive structures it creates that you didn't anticipate. And when you see those things, if you can't find a way out, you should just like change course. And I think that's, I think that's my biggest advice that I would have for people when they're trying to find like that idea that's going to resonate. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for chatting with me. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.